SpaceX is steadily moving towards Starship's ninth integrated flight test, with preparations ramping up for the all-important static fire of Ship 35. Currently stationed inside Mega Bay 2, the ship recently had all six Raptor engines installed. This engine installation strongly suggests that SpaceX has pinpointed and addressed the root cause of the propellant leak that led to Flight 8's failure. That leak triggered an engine shutdown, internal fire, and subsequent vehicle breakup. The upcoming static fire will serve as a critical validation test, recreating the same operational conditions to confirm whether the new design mitigations can withstand the stress and prevent similar failures. Only if the static fire proves successful and the fixes are verified will the FAA move forward with issuing a launch license for Flight 9. Meanwhile, Ship 35's flight partner, Booster 14, has already completed its static fire campaign and is now back in the Mega Bay for final pre-launch checkouts. During this final prep phase, the booster will undergo detailed inspections, especially of its 33 Raptor engines, to ensure all systems are go. At the same time, teams are performing last-minute upgrades, including tweaks to the avionics, plumbing lines, and pressurization hardware. The hot stage adapter ring was mounted onto the booster on Wednesday morning, finalizing the upper interface for stage separation. Interestingly, several vents on the ring appear to have been welded shut this time likely based on flight data confirming that the remaining openings are sufficient to vent the upper stage exhaust without causing back pressure or disruption during hot staging. Also, sealing them could boost structural rigidity and simplify manufacturing without affecting performance. If everything stays on track, Flight 9 is shaping up for liftoff in the first half of next month. At the launch site, the pad is also entering the final stages of readiness. The launch tower's chopstick arms recently underwent booster catch simulation tests performing open close cycles to validate the actuators, hydraulics, and electrical systems. These drills are part of standard launch preparations, especially after the modifications made in response to Flight 8's lessons. The pad infrastructure itself is also receiving attention. Crews are replacing heat exchangers and cryogenic pumps that were damaged during the last flight. In addition, several new pumps are being installed to speed up the process of propellant loading. Alongside this, Vaporizers and plumbing lines are being upgraded or replaced to improve overall flow rates and system resilience. Importantly, SpaceX has expanded the site's propellant storage capacity over the past few months by adding new horizontal tanks and transfer lines. This expanded capacity, paired with the upgraded ground support equipment, will allow SpaceX to support more frequent Starship launches with quicker turnaround times, not just from this pad, but eventually from both operational pads at Starbase. Shifting the focus to the second launch pad, Pad B, significant construction milestones were achieved over the past week. One of the major highlights was the rollout of the massive flame diverter buckets on April 12, which had been under fabrication at the Sanchez site for several months. Using cranes, the diverter buckets were carefully lowered into the flame trench of Pad B and positioned atop five reinforced support pillars. These pillars had been installed in late March, followed shortly by the placement of a structural crossbeam spanning all five supports. This aerial image, taken before the diverters were installed, shows how the crossbeam spans across and connects the five support pillars, forming the base onto which the diverters were later mounted. Now that the diverter buckets are installed, the next critical component awaiting installation is the top ridge segment currently staged at the Sanchez site. This ridge will cap the diverter system and serve as the interface for the water channels that feed the deluge system. During a launch, High-pressure water will be routed through this ridge and sprayed through an array of precision drilled holes across the diverter's surface. This water flow helps absorb radiant heat and suppress the intense acoustic energy produced by the engines, while the diverter structure itself channels the exhaust plume safely away from the pad. Speaking of the deluge system, much of the ground infrastructure for it is already in place near Pad B. The large water storage tanks have been installed adjacent to the launch tower, and pipeline integration is now underway. Several large diameter steel water pipes have already been laid, including designated weir pipes that will regulate and evenly distribute water flow from the storage tanks into the main feed lines. The main water feed lines are being placed inside trenches previously excavated at the site. These buried pipes will deliver water directly to the diverter system and the launch mount. With a total of nine tanks eventually expected to support the system, the full plumbing layout will become clearer in the coming weeks. Along the inner walls of the flame trench, you can see built-in holes designed to deliver water to the flame diverter system. At the same time, some of this water will be directed to the launch mount's top deck, where it will be spread across the surface for thermal protection and sound suppression during engine ignition. The Pad B launch mount is currently being assembled at the Sanchez site, 
and will be transported to the launch pad once the assembly is complete and the pad is fully prepared to receive it. Parallel to these efforts, teams have begun laying propellant lines that will connect the tank farm to the launch mount. These pipes will handle the liquid methane and liquid oxygen flows needed to fuel the launch vehicle during pre-launch operations. Altogether, several months of work remain to complete the works and bring Pad B into full operation. At the production site, teams have completed the stacking of Starship 37 inside Mega Bay 2, with the final piece, the aft section, integrated just a few days ago. Alongside Ship 37, preparations are underway for Ship 36, which is being ready for cryoproof testing. Meanwhile, parts for ships 38 through 40 are being assembled inside the Star Factory. Starting with ship 39, SpaceX will transition to the next generation Starship Lock 3 vehicles, which I've covered in detail in my previous videos, linked in the description. Demolition of the high bay is continuing steadily, with teams methodically cutting through structural columns and beams, floor by floor. This approach ensures the safe removal of the building's massive wall panels, which are taken down one section at a time. Additionally, the Stargate office building was completely demolished last week. The wedge-shaped extension of the Star Factory is also being prepared for demolition to make way for the colossal Gigabay rocket integration facility. I've gone into detail about the Gigabay project in a previous video, check it out in the description for a comprehensive breakdown. Groundwork for a similar integration facility has already started at SpaceX's Roberts Road site inside Kennedy Space Center, designed to support Starship launches from Pad 39A. The launch tower for Pad 39A was assembled back in 2022. Recently, excavation work has commenced at the pad to construct a flame trench, similar to the one currently being built for Starbase Pad B in Texas. The orbital launch mount for LC-39A is also under construction at Roberts Road, following a design similar to the one being built for Starbase Pad B. According to SpaceX, pending environmental approvals, the first Starship launch from Florida is expected by late 2025 with the rockets for these initial launches being shipped from Starbase. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. Just this week, as part of drafting the federal budget for fiscal year 2026, the Trump White House sent NASA a proposal that's ignited outrage across the space community. The plan calls for slashing NASA's overall funding from $25 billion to $20 billion, a brutal 20% cut. The biggest blow lands on the Science Mission Directorate which faces a staggering 50% reduction, dropping from $7.5 billion to just $3.9 billion. This proposal puts several high-impact missions on the chopping block. The Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, fully assembled and set for a 2026 launch, could be cancelled despite being within budget. The Mars Sample Return Mission, meant to retrieve rock and soil samples already collected by the Perseverance rover on Mars, and Da Vinci, a probe aimed at studying Venus's toxic atmosphere, are also at risk, despite years of investment and engineering progress. Several programs in Earth science, planetary science, and astrophysics are also vulnerable. In contrast, flagship observatories like the James Webb Space Telescope and the aging but still valuable Hubble Space Telescope appear to be spared, at least for now. A particularly controversial move is the proposed shutdown of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland a major hub for Earth and space science research. Shutting it down could result in the loss of up to 10,000 jobs and erase decades of institutional knowledge that can't easily be replaced. Meanwhile, funding for SpaceX-linked programs and commercial vehicle development remains intact, signaling a shift toward private sector partnerships and a Mars-first agenda. Historically, NASA's funding once peaked at 4.4% of the federal budget during the Apollo era in 1966. Today, it's around 0.5%, and the proposed reduction will likely push it even lower, undermining the agency's ability to maintain leadership in space exploration and science. The response from the scientific community has been swift. Elon Musk, despite his close ties to the Trump administration, has publicly called the proposed cuts troubling, though he cannot formally oppose them due to SpaceX's role as a major NASA contractor. The Planetary Society warned the move could plunge NASA into a dark age, wasting billions in sunk costs and ending dozens of missions. Former NASA Administrator Bill Nelson also expressed strong opposition, stating that the cuts would undermine decades of progress in space science. Meanwhile, Maryland's congressional delegation has vowed to block these proposed budget reductions, committing to restore funding and protect critical NASA missions. Amidst this budget cut, Jared Isaacman, a billionaire entrepreneur and experienced private astronaut nominated to lead NASA, faced a Senate confirmation hearing on April 9th. 
Despite his close ties to Elon Musk and SpaceX, Isaacman stated clearly that his allegiance lies with NASA and the nation, not any individual or corporation. He voiced strong support for Artemis, vowed to extend ISS operations to 2030, and advocated for simultaneous Moon and Mars missions. Do you believe it is possible to stand up a full mission to, mission to the Moon and a full mission to the Mars si simultaneously? Senator, I, as, I, as I mentioned my prepared remarks, I think we can absolutely do that. We can figure out the space economy in low Earth orbit. We can run more scientific missions. This, this is the agency that went from sending Alan Shepard on a suborbital mission, and eight years later, we saw Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the surface of the moon. Do I think that we can get back to the moon, chart a course for Mars, and do all the other things? Absolutely, Senator. However, the proposed cuts pose serious challenges for his leadership from day one demanding strategic choices, political grit, and likely some painful trade-offs. Blue Origin achieved a historic milestone on April 14 with the successful launch of its NS-31 mission, the company's 11th human spaceflight, and the first to carry an all-women crew. The launch took place at Launch Site 1, located in the West Texas desert, where the company's new Shepard rocket lifted off on a suborbital journey beyond the Kármán line the internationally accepted boundary of space located 100 kilometers above sea level. The mission consisted of six crew members, each bringing unique expertise and significance to the historic flight. Among them were Aisha Bow, a former NASA rocket scientist and STEM advocate, Amanda Nine, a Nobel Peace Prize-nominated civil rights activist and bioastronautics researcher, Gail King, CBS journalist and television host, Katy Perry, internationally renowned pop star and philanthropist, Carrie Ann Flynn, an independent film producer, and Lauren Sinchez, aerospace executive and pilot. Together, they made history as the first all-female team on a commercial spaceflight, signaling a powerful step toward greater diversity in space exploration. Powered by a single B3 engine burning liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, New Shepard reached nearly 2,000 miles per hour before the booster and capsule separated at the edge of space. While the capsule continued its upward arc toward space, the booster executed a controlled descent. Using aerodynamic fins and a restart of its main engine, it performed a pinpoint vertical landing approximately seven and a half minutes after launch, touching down safely about three kilometers from the launch pad, demonstrating the reusability of the system. Inside the capsule, the crew crossed the Kármán line and entered microgravity, where they experienced about four minutes of weightlessness. During this window, they floated freely inside the pressurized cabin, performed light scientific research in plant biology and human physiology, and gazed out at Earth through New Shepard's expansive panoramic windows. After reaching its highest point, known as Apogee, the capsule began its descent back to Earth. Atmospheric drag initially slowed the vehicle, after which three main parachutes were deployed to further reduce velocity. Moments before touchdown, retro thrusters fired a cushion of nitrogen gas to slow the descent and soften the landing. The capsule then touched down gently in the Texas desert, concluding the ten-and-a-half-minute suborbital journey. After landing, the crew emerged one by one to a warm welcome from Jeff Bezos. With wide smiles and visible wonder, they shared emotional reflections on the journey and the humbling view of Earth from space. While Blue Origin hasn't announced the date of its next New Shepard flight, the company plans to ramp up both crewed and uncrewed missions and continue making suborbital space accessible to researchers, educators, artists, and everyday civilians. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.